for the contribution candidates. What positive steps would you take to stem skyrocketing property taxes? And Amanda's not here, so we're going to move on to Martin. You're back up again. Excellent. Well, I'm sure you're going to sit down. Um, I think. Sorry. Property taxes are going to be a reflect. We can't hear you. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Excellent. Property taxes are going to be a reflection of the type of housing that we attract and build here. And I think we have to be honest about what that looks like. Our comprehensive plan is gonna be a good opportunity for us to look at real numbers and stop artificially guessing at, at what we're dealing with. I think we all are aware generally what the cost of living feels like here and who's building homes here. I've sat in plenty of county meetings where people who are talking to me are not, candidly, they're telling me during the county meeting that they're not from Buncombe County. That when they're up here for the summer from Florida, they don't like dealing with XYZ thing. I, I'm concerned about addressing property taxes for folks who live in Buncombe all year round. The folks who are using this as a vacation home, completely different story. I don't think that's something we need to prioritize, but if we're gonna address skyrocketing property taxes, we have to look at who's purchasing homes in our community and address it accordingly. If we don't, if we're not candid about that, if we're just taking a generalized approach that everyone who has a home in Buncombe County is dealing with the same circumstances or dealing with the same revenue, it's just, it's incorrect. And I think our data is going to weigh that out. If we don't make significant changes after we get our comp plan and we have that back, I think we're going to be in a, in a pretty significant set of trouble here. So let's focus on real numbers, get the real data, and make decisions based on the data that we have, not guessing theoretically about how much your neighbor's paying in taxes. I'm very concerned, especially for our, our neighborhoods, uh, our historically black neighborhoods we mentioned earlier, are facing significantly higher property taxes than they should be. Um, relative to the, the income that we know folks have. Those are neighborhoods that we claim to care about, that we're saying we care a lot about, but not addressing the reality that some people who have homes valued at a million dollars are paying pretty close to the same amount of taxes from folks who bought their homes 50 years ago. That's not okay, and I think we need to address that. Thank you. Al? Start with to start with a lot of the problems we have in the property tax starts with the state legislature. You know, when we were looking at what we could do for short-term rentals, if we could charge more, but no, we found out after our legal department went through it that the way it is, we have to go by the value of the home. Uh, the value of the home and doing that, you know, it doesn't. But the whole thing is with the comp plan and all, we've got to make our property taxes not only fairer, but more equitable. And a lot like, I like what they're doing in South Carolina. We're losing people with, uh, if after you're 65 or older, you know, it's frozen, your taxes. Well, I know a lot of friends of mine would not move back home, but now they're living in Greenville for that reason. But I think here is where we've got to work together, the counties and the municipalities. And we have a lobbyist, and I think we've got to really work with the legislature and through our legislative delegation to make sure that we update our tax structure because it's not in the 21st century and especially to make it equitable because, you know, it is problems in what was the historically black communities. I see that. You know, my parents' home that I inherited is when you compare the percentage of increase that to a house in Biltmore Forest, it would surprise you. But we've got to change the structure though and we've got to work together and it's going to take all of us doing that because if we don't, we're gonna force the citizens of Buncombe County, just some of them will have to sell their land to survive. And we see a lot of that and it's not working. But it all goes back to, we've got to change the structure of our property taxes and update the property tax, what we're paying for. And when you look, I think here again, we need to work with the city too because for those of us who live in the city, 
when you add your city and county taxes together, that's another issue. You know, I've had people in the county that tell me, well, you pay city taxes, but they didn't understand that we pay both in the city. And that's something I think we could work together and combine services to make it a lot cheaper. It's a lot we can do, but we've got to tighten our belt and sit down and work together to make those changes that we need to, and especially to help the working people in the county. Thank you. Robert? Yes, well, just what I said a while ago. Just imagine of all the houses that we have in Buncombe County, city and county, that are being sold for one third more than what the tax value is on that house. Of what we could do with that extra money right there of helping the elderly people. And that's the thing a lot of us really need to concentrate on is they lived during the 40s, during the Depression, and they're doing without medicine and eating leftover food, you know, for two and three days. We don't think about them people right there. We are not thinking about what we are. What we're doing is people are moving in here from other areas, skyrocketing our property tax. That's who done it. We did not do it when, like I said, you've got a house for 300,000, 400,000, sold for five and 600, but the property tax don't change. That is double money. You know how many people we could help in $200,000 homes, affordable housing, uh, go toward affordable housing to help people get off the street. We need to help everyone here and not just help the rich that are involved here that move in and say, your property tax ain't that much, just like city. You pay a city and a county but California, New York, and them come in and say, my tax is 27,000, I'm only paying 7,000 here. Well, you're the one who raised it up. We're the ones living here, working for 12, 14, 16 dollars an hour, just barely making it. Where they come from, they was making 40 and 50 dollars an hour. So we have let the problem create, but we need to fix it. And we can as commissioner, but we need to talk to our legislature we need to be in contact with them, tell them this has got to be changed. Thank you. Anthony? Well, it'd be very easy for me just to say I agree with what's already been said and then sit down. But the thing is, though, is we do have an issue in this, in this county. One of the things that I think that we've got to make sure is that our elderly folks who have lived here, We've got to make sure we have programs, whether it's working with the state legislator. We, we got to quit pointing fingers and, and saying we got to do it. Let's just do it. Let's work with them. Say, look, can, can we, with, with people who are, who are elderly, can we, can we freeze their property tax? But I would like to ask a question to, to the tax assessor. How is it if someone has lived here their entire life in a, in a house and they have just basically made, maintained upkeep? And you're telling me today in 2022 that the tax value of that home is $200,000. But someone comes from California and builds a $500,000 home right beside me. Now, why is my value of my home just skyrocketing? So we need to ask those questions. We need to ask those tough questions. What can we do? And, and, and they're right. You know, if you live in one of the municipalities, you're paying double, basically. And what we got to do is we got to work on that. We also got to make sure that when we revalue our home, that it's fair across the board, from Broad River to Barnesville to Biltmore Forest to Leicester, that we're all in it together. But we also got to do something that someone always told me, follow the money. Follow the money and see what the issue is. Let's look at, some, at, at the current revenue stream that's coming in. Is there ways, is there ways we can take that money and offset this with some of our uh, taxes that's going up? Are there programs that, that are in place right now that may or may not be working? You know, if we're gonna sit here and we're gonna say we're saving X amount of dollars by doing this and X amount of dollars by doing that, if you're truly saving by doing the things that they said was going on, then that savings should come back to the people, should it not? 
We can't take money that we're saying we're saving money on our light bill and move it to something else and then tell the people we're saving them money. Well, the way I do my budget, if I have money in the, that I've saved, then that means I can save it. And if I'm in government, then why don't I just maybe, well, if I can save it, why can't I give it back? But the thing is, though, is we got to make sure that we got to be careful. It's the role of government to take care of its people. And that comes at a price. But it can't come to a price where we have to start cutting things. If you are happy with the services that you're getting from your, your law enforcement, your EMS, your fire departments, your, your, your parks and rec, we start looking at things and how to reduce those things, then we may not be able to keep funding them. So we got to work together and get it, come up with a, a, a solution to the problem. Done. Well, I'm going to say it, say it to me, but I'll try not to get too emotional in the crowd. It turns people off. They don't like emotion, you know? But you've heard the solutions right here tonight. Robert gave a great one. Go ahead and up the taxes when the house sells for that high value. That's what the value of that house is at that time. And if you check your legislation, it says fair market value. The only problem is they come right back around and draw a circle around that house and the rest of the houses in there and increase all those houses to a fair market value. And you're just barely hanging on. And you didn't tell your neighbors to sell theirs at that high price. So there's got to be a way to do that. And I hear this. I hear, well, it's the legislature. Who elects the legislature? Who elects the commissioners? Who elects the city council? It's gone way, way beyond, folks. Democrat, Republican, conservative, liberal. It's down to the brass tax. Are we going to survive? Or are we going to price everybody out of the home? <clears throat> and we're going to float a seventy million dollar bond, and forty million is for affordable housing. So we go into the poor houses and fix them up. But what's going to happen the next time they value those houses? They're going to up the value of them. What's going to happen to those people that they help? They won't have the money to pay the tax at that. So then, who's going to pay the taxes? They're going to be coming back to us to pay the taxes. You got to take the money you got and make it work. That's what each of us do in our own budgets at home. And that's what the city has to learn to do, and it doesn't. And the county needs to learn to do, and it doesn't. Because everybody wants to do all these bland and glory things and schemes to get more votes. And who's responsible for that? I'll let you think about that one, okay? Thank you. Okay. Commissioners, thank you. Now it's time to uh, move forward to our mayoral candidates. First question. Do you plan to continue to reimagine policing in Asheville? And how would your actions impact public safety? And Kim, you're up first. Absolutely, I support this as a key strategic priority for the city of Asheville. This is not only a necessity, but an opportunity. We are currently not meeting our service obligations. We're not meeting our moral obligations. We're not meeting our fiscal obligations around public safety. We are planning for vacancies instead of meeting this moment with diversifying our public safety response. So what can that look like? I want the city to lead, not lag, on living wages, and that means that it needs to be based on the cost of housing. We need to work with, between the city and the county to build housing for our first responders and make sure that we're paying them enough that they can be eligible for the down payment assistance program. I'm currently working with a group around the Code Purple shelter that has city, county, um, nonprofit, faith leaders, and neighbors at the table to better understand what we're doing around, right now around homelessness. What we're doing is not meeting the moment of this crisis, and it's not working. We all see the issues with the inhumane response to homelessness. Now, 
We just went through an extreme crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I know that we failed in a lot of ways. We dropped the ball on the emergency shelter. We missed an opportunity to bring neighbors to the table around that. And I understand that a lot of people may feel frustrated that they don't want to see us have an emergency shelter in the, in the future. But I do support the National Alliance to End Homelessness consultant who's helping us to bring us out of our silos and get all of our cards on the table so we're not duplicating services and running people around and um, just chasing people with trespassing charges. And I think that we're all seeing the failures of that. But I'm also the liaison to the Homeless Initiative Advisory Committee where we have new neighbor liaisons to that. What I would like to see us do is have a humane response to homelessness, to mental health issues, to the opioid crisis, to intimate partner violence, to the violent crime that's happening among our youth. We heard a presentation in June with solutions from JARC and from My Daddy Taught Me That. And guess what they need? Resources and a place to provide services. Turn around and August meeting of public safety, we have $419,000 of funds from asset seizure um, that we're not accountable, so we can't have that shared accountability that can lead to shared successes together. But also, it turns out they're supposed to be used for schools. And unfortunately, that passed in a way that doesn't have council um, accountability. Now, if we instead have a pipeline for homelessness, for mental health, for opioid crisis, I'm not talking about something that's not doable. Buncombe County Community Paramedicine is doing it now. 80% of their calls are happening in the city in downtown and West Asheville. Let's amplify and meet this moment by adding to our public safety response and pay our staff so they can afford to live here. Thank you. Mayor Manheim. Uh, good evening. First, let me apologize for running late this evening. I was participating in the region's Big Brothers Big Sisters event tonight, so I apologize for that late start for me. Um, and let me just, first of all, introduce myself. My name is Esther Banheimer, and I'm honored to serve as the mayor of Asheville. And I do this work because I love our community, and it's a place where I think um, all of our children should be able to grow up and feel safe, find a job, find a home, and be the next generation to contribute to our beautiful city, just like so many of you have done, unless you're from California, apparently. But, but for the rest of you. <laughs> Um, and I, I feel that um, achieving that job with you is what I should be doing and am doing as your mayor. Um, I am married to a school teacher at Inca High School, uh, Mark Harris. He's a coach and a teacher. He is an, uh, uh, an alumni of Inca High School and related to the rest of you in Buncombe County. And my um, husband and I have three boys. So this. This community means a lot to us. Our folks live here, my parents, um, and, and so for me, it's very personal. Um, this is an important question to me. I, I hear a lot from the community about concerns around safety. I also hear the very deep desire and importance of reimagining public safety. We know that um, historically, the way we have served communities through what we call public safety in America has resulted in systemic racism and the over uh, jailing of people who are black and brown. And I think there is a very real concern around addressing that. But how do we do this change, this systemic change, and keep our community safe? And in the short time I have left, I will highlight a few things. It takes collaboration, it takes cooperation, it takes communication. The first thing we did this year is we consolidated the 911 call center between the city and the county. And thank you, Martin, for talking about the importance of working together between the county commission and the city council. That is something that we work hard to do. Um, we also have funded uh, programs that will create, hopefully, um, but will create permanent supportive housing that is designed to, tra to tra transition folks who are experiencing homelessness out of homelessness and into housing and providing them that wraparound services so they stay continuously housed. Um, and I do support the concept of a low barrier shelter because I think that is what we are missing right now in our community. We are also reallocating some of the services traditionally performed by police 
to other departments that can be performed in a non-policing capacity like animal control, the noise ordinance, some traffic enforcement, things like that that don't require policing response. So those are some of the ways, and I look forward to continuing this conversation. Stay. Stay. <laughs> you can read the question. Okay, what steps would you take to support the police now, and how do you plan to help attract and retain better quality candidates? This is a great question because we are down 40%. It's actually more than 40% right now. We're in a crisis situation in the staffing of our police department. This council just passed a budget that raises wages in our police department. We are trying to make sure we are offering a competitive pay. We also are one of the only regional departments that pay officers while they're in training, while they're in basic law enforcement training. And we're also paying uh, for a recruiter to help recruit and then eventually retain uh, the police and our police department so that they don't go through that training process and then eventually leave our police department. So we are trying to do that. What we're also hearing from our police, um, and I see Rondell Lance is here tonight with the FOP, um, is that they're not hearing enough support from elected officials. Somewhere in the time that I've been mayor since 2013, it became a political thing as to whether or not you support the police in your community. That um, conversation, I think, is unproductive. I think that if I were to sit and have a conversation with each one of you, you'd probably tell me about an experience you had where the police needed to respond and you were grateful that they were there. We can all agree about that. Community safety is important and it is necessary to have a well-functioning and a well-staffed and a well-trained police department. But it is also important that we have proper training and that's one of the things that we've been working on, making sure that we're providing funding for that training. It is also important that we help our police department work in community. You cannot have an effective police department unless there is a cross-community dialogue about what's happening in neighborhoods, what are neighborhood leaders and other community members saying they need in their community? So that's something that we recognize is very important. We are all people. We want what's best for our community. We want to be safe. We don't want to worry somebody broke into our house. We don't want to worry about our kids like my child who goes to Asheville High and they're on a lockdown in the first week of school. Make a mother have a heart attack. We don't want that. But we also don't want to continue the history in America of confining people of color due to systemic racism that is thread throughout institutions. Not necessarily people, but institutions. And the way you eradicate that, you have to make policy changes. You have to reallocate the way you traditionally did things. Why do you need a police officer every time you have a noise complaint? We have 2,000 noise complaints a year in Asheville. Let's help the police department out. They don't need to go to all of those. We're gonna have our permitting office handle it. That's not radical. You know, that's not defunding the police. That's reimagining public safety. That's what I think of it when I, when I think about it. I just think it's a better way of us all living together in this community. Kim? I absolutely, I absolutely support any individual who is working to provide quality services with an equity lens. Support looks like accountability for shared responsibility and shared success. I have high expectations when it comes to counting $419,000 in cash because we have a really recent history in, under Ron Moore's tenure of cash, guns, and drugs going missing. I have a high expectation that we would understand where the resources come from during the high um, traffic drug areas. If we're gonna extract resources from neighborhoods, because we're here to talk about neighborhoods, and we see the disparities in which neighborhoods have had investment, then we need to invest in community safety and invest in safety for the neighborhoods from which those resources have been extracted from. What could that look like? What would it look like when I talk to one of my students at Asheville High School who was in the lockdown, <coughs> And they knew that we were having this conversation at the city level about whether or not we were gonna invest in youth programming. Could that situation have been prevented? I would hope that our Asheville Police Department officers would want that too. And so we need to come together to talk about what it looks like to reimagine public safety, but it shouldn't be a surprise to ask about budget accountability or policy, because that's the role of city council. 
The role of city council is to oversee our budget plans and policies. And if we do send the right person with the right tools and training for mental health crisis, for homelessness response, for intimate partner violence, that means that our staff in the police department can be doing the important work to address violent crime. And I think that that will um, be a better job to fill and hopefully we won't have vacancies, but we'll be having an equitable and quality response and a return on investment for your taxpayer dollars. But you'll also see that in the outcomes of safer communities and safer schools with the neighborhood resilience for you to be able to take care of your neighborhood needs and the people close to you, because we need to share in this work to reimagine public safety together. You can stay up. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Third question. What are your thoughts on low barrier shelters, camping, and meal programs? If elected, how would you move on these issues? Right. Low barrier shelters. Something that I've learned since we um, didn't run a low barrier shelter <laughs> was that we could have. What we did was at the very beginning of the pandemic, we said, everyone, go home. Be safe when you're at home. Well, what happened to all of our unhoused neighbors that didn't have a home to go to? They did hear that they should not go into congregate shelter. We were not supposed to go into groups. So it was much safer for people to sleep solo or in small groups and often outside. That's what we, we should have learned together. But it didn't look good to have that big encampment at the front of the entrance of our city. So there was a lot of pressure on council to move people. The CDC recommended not to move people, that it would displace people from access to resources, um, that there would be sanitation issues. We could have provided bathrooms, we didn't. But instead, we temporarily displaced people by housing them in a hotel with some services while it was still operating as a hotel in a neighborhood that didn't have the resources that they needed to participate fully and without a lack, with a lack of accountability. So we didn't really run a low barrier shelter. But one of the things I'm learning is that Missoula, Montana is a good example of a city that said, you know, we're spending a lot of money on hotel rooms. Let's do managed camping. Right now we're doing unmanaged camping in Asheville. What would it look like if we had managed camping in small groups, work with faith communities? Maybe a small group looks like between 10 and 15 people, bathrooms, sanitation, wraparound support, with the goal of getting people housed. Because I want my neighbors to be housed. And I think all of us do. So low barrier shelter, we're still learning about what to do. We've, we've made some mistakes and we hope that you'll stay with us in answering this. I'm willing to stay at the table and I need your help. So that's what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you to stay at the table with me. Um, camping, we need bathroom. We already have camping. We have citywide unmanaged camping. Let's manage it, do it better, get people out of camping into housing. Um, and then needle programs are, <laughs> The reason we have needle exchange in North Carolina is because it saves lives. We have an opioid crisis in our community. People are dying and we have issues with hep C and we don't want to see an AIDS epidemic explode. So we need to use tested health and human services to help address the needs of opioid crisis. What we don't have is really good sanitation options. So when I'm in my neighborhood trying to do a community cleanup and I'm picking up a needle, I shouldn't be surprised that it's on the ground because there's nowhere to put it. Before I was on council, I asked if it was possible to look at a model from Portland, Maine to have small sharps containers on all the city trash and recycling bins so that when we are cleaning up needles or anyone for any purpose has a needle and somewhere to put it, that they could safely dispose of it. And then we would need to follow up with sanitation because otherwise we'll see that overflow issue. So are we getting it right? No. Can we make it better? Yes. I'm committed to having the conversations in public that allow you to participate, bring professional lived experience, address the issues so that we can serve everyone better, including our neighbors experiencing homelessness. We know that 74% from the last point in time count, most recent address is here. We're talking about the people of Asheville. So this, it's on now, okay. Um, the pandemic has brought to light for us some serious challenges that we have in our community. Um, before the pandemic, serving on council for this long, I, I did not hear very often from constituents at all about issues around our unhoused folks. Now I hear quite a lot about it. And that is because I know a lot of people are seeing it. Uh, in our community because we have much higher numbers now. We know that. Our numbers have jumped from 500 
uh, folks that are experiencing homelessness roughly into the 600, 625. But during the point time count, what we learned is that approximately 200 and, uh, plus folks were unsheltered meaning they were not in shelter on the night of the point in time count, even though there were 150 shelter beds available, I'm rounding approximately. What that tells me is our shelter needs are not meeting those in our community. So if you're one of the 800 people that sent me the article about uh, Texas and how they've solved um, homelessness issues, maybe you all have received this too, one of the things that we have learned about our situation through this the hard way is that we are siloed. We have the county that provides certain services. We have the city who is not a direct provider of any services around um, those experiencing homelessness. Then we have all these nonprofit providers, whether you're ABCCM or Homeward Bound or um, Mission Rescue or Haywood Street Congregation. And we have to coordinate all of ourselves if we're going to be effective. So for me, I wanna answer this question. I am very supportive of a low barrier shelter and I'm gonna tell you why. During this pandemic, I have been meeting with communities all over America, virtually Zooming with them and learning all about the different models of how to serve the community and those who are experiencing homelessness. And I have learned that we are missing this piece of the puzzle. A low barrier shelter, if a police officer responds to somebody, it's nine o'clock at night and they've OD'd, and this happens all the time here, what can they do for that person? They either have the jail or the hospital. And if, if that's it, there's no place else to go. So a low barrier shelter is an option if you haven't made curfew, if you don't have an ID, if you're not sober. Instead of spending the night on the street, a low barrier shelter is an option. So I think it's a critical missing piece for our community, but I know there are a lot of people that need to come in with that uh, understanding as well, and it's gonna require an important community conversation. I do not support managed camping, and I will tell you why. All those cities that have tried managed camping have a provider that manages it so that it's not unsafe. We have asked our providers in Asheville, no one wants to do that job. This isn't really an option for us. So we have got to go a different direction. And yes, I support needle exchanges. Thank you. Thank, thank uh, everyone for <laughs> the speed dating that we've just gone through <laughs> and answering all these questions. This is a great time to talk. I really appreciate it. Um, I'll tell you what, we are about uh, 10 minutes ahead of schedule. Let's take a 10 minute break. And when that'll give me time to sit with my colleagues and figure out what the questions are that have been submitted.